Welcome to Mike and Heather in the Morning, broadcasting live from the Key Radio Provo Studios and throughout Utah Valley, Uinta Basin, Sevier Valley, South Central Utah, Castle Valleys, and beyond. Here to bring clarity, order, and depth to our conversation is Pastor Jeremy Howard of Payson Bible Church. Good morning, my friend. It is Tuesday. And we are so thankful that you have chosen to spend some time with us this morning. And just as a reward for your faithfulness, uh, today we're going to be doing some giveaways. Yeah. Yes. I Good can't tell stuff. you when, but it'll be during this hour. And there's going to be two things. We're going to be giving away five things. Five things. We're giving away five things, two categories. <laughs> we're giving away a, a MacArthur study Bible, and we're giving away not one, not two, not three, but... Four tickets to this weekend's show for King and Country. It's going to be great. a slightly used MacArthur study Bible. It is not slightly used. <laughs> I open it up to look inside. It's not used. I didn't actually read it. <laughs> it's got Heather's footnotes. <laughs> Once you read it, <laughs> stop it. Did you underline or circle? I anything? didn't. I didn't do it. I'll stop it. You're picking on me. Oh, and in the studio with us, of course, we have Grant and. <laughs> That oh, is the nastiest Sorry, was, was that on air? <laughs> I think that was awful. Pastor Jeremy Howard. Yeah, I don't know if we were going to invite him back or not. <laughs> that was great. And Grant Burkhalter in the studio with us as well. He's pushing all of our buttons. And we have a huge topic to talk about today. Actually, this whole couple, of, I'm tired. I am tired. I've been reading this book called Christian Ethics. It is like a 1,200 plus page book. I've been staying on top of my reading so that I am prepared to ask all the questions that I have. And so, uh, question though, yes. are you reading? We're not covering every every topic in there. Are you reading every every page? Uh huh. So even the ones we're not talking about. Yes, you're reading. I am reading you're them amazing. all. Well, I figured I paid for the book. I might as well get. It. I get my money. Heather, it's a textbook. And, <laughs> it's a good textbook. <laughs> you have but, to read every page. But this it's stuff a reference. Is, it is really good stuff, though, and it really does challenge a person. We started with an intro to Christian ethics back last week, Monday, with uh, Dr. Wayne Grudem, which was wonderful. And then we went and talking about um, God's honor and where are we getting our ethics from and um, how we need to be, like, when we are approaching God, uh, we need to be approaching him with utter humility because uh, he is our creator. Uh, we talked about parenting and marriage and civil government, and we talked about abortion and euthanasia and suicide. Yesterday, we talked about health alcohol and drugs. And my friend, these are all humongous topics. And this is something that is not exhaustive in these conversations because we only have 55 minutes to talk about them. And you need at least that just to talk about like the intro to all of these topics. So, uh, but this is hopefully uh, beneficial for all of us because we need to at least know how to approach these things. The book is good too. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's easy reading. Mm -hmm. It's uh, by Dr. Wayne Grudem, yep. Christian Ethics. Mm -hmm. What's the Christian okay. ethics, that's what it's called. An, An introduction. introduction to biblical moral reasoning. Mm -hmm. It's good stuff. Uh, everything, though, uh, we're going to be talking about, we're going to be discussing. And some of the stuff is, is sin issues. Like today is going to be a very difficult topic for a lot of us, don't you think? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> And and so, <laughs> and, and, no Heather. No, it's gonna be easy. What does the Bible say? <laughs> well, but that's the thing. And we all have we all have things that we struggle with, right? And and no matter what we do, we need to understand that when we talk about these things, we need to talk about things uh, biblically, but lovingly as well, and always pointing back to Jesus because Jesus is so good. Jesus is better than everything. Um, in fact, I love that old hymn, "Grace, Grace, Grace," that is greater than all my sin. And we need to be extending grace to each other in even how we speak. So, uh, but we're going to be talking truth. And the reason why we do that is because, you know, Key Radio is about truth. You know, it's Life Unlocked Truth Unleashed. And we want to do that, but in a loving way. Um, and we have Pastor Jeremy Howard. We couldn't think of anybody uh, better to talk about these particular topics. Well, you have a very limited scope of what you can think about. <laughs> You're the man. <laughs> you are the man. You, you we appreciate this. you. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about homosexuality, transgenderism, and even a little bit about pedophilia. Again, big topics, um, and we won't do it just as comprehensively uh, for 55 minutes, but we are going to be touching on some of the major things and always pointing back to Jesus. Um, so if you have questions or concerns, um, or you just have a comment, uh, please give us a text, 855-539-4583. Um, 
How are you doing today? Are you are you ready for our conversation, Pastor? Sure. Tony? Yeah. Doing well. Mm-hmm. Yep. We got a super busy week. This is how I'm starting my week because Mondays are my day off, mm-hmm. and I'm usually here on Fridays to end my week, um, my work week. But here I am to begin my work week. A little, well, uh, Heather, little different. Heather begged you to come in and, and talk about es- this. Essentially, yeah. yeah. There was, I'm uh, not too proud. There was some <laughs> bartering <laughs> that went on. No. Yeah, no, it, and I'm pleased to do it. No, this is, uh, it is a complex issue because of the culture that we live in and because of, um, unfortunately, lines that have been blurred that don't need to be blurred, mm-hmm. uh, particularly regarding the idea of authority and who gets to say what what's good and what's true and who doesn't. Um, all those lines are being blurred in our culture today, which make any ethical issue really complicated today in mm-hmm. America and, and around the world. So, um, yeah, uh, we're, it'll be an interesting conversation today. And we'll say things that maybe to just the average American mind will be like, whoa, that is way over the line. But um, again, what where, where's the line? Um, it's being blurred. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and ultimately, it's it's God's authority, um, and that's what we have to fall back on, and and that that's the whole point of our conversation is what does the Bible say about all of these things? Uh, so it's it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be a very good conversation. Um, let's go to some music, and let's just kind of gather our thoughts, and then I want you to again. Um, If you've got questions or concerns throughout the program, please give us a text. Uh, You are listening to Mike and Heather in the morning on Key Radio with Pastor Jeremy Howard of Payson Bible Church. (laughs) Key Radio, life unlocked. (laughs) Truth unleashed. Again, Mike and Heather in the morning. Grant at the controls and our special good friend guest pastor is Jeremy Howard of Payson Bible Church in Payson. And our topic is pretty amazing. And difficult. Yes, and I think wonderful. it is. And Reg- wonderful. It is regardless of, you know, how clear the Bible is about things. Mm-hmm. It's still a difficult topic because there's an emotional aspect in a lot of cases. And so we approach it as we always do with compassion and love, right? Pastor Jeremy, do you have some compassion and love? Depending <laughs> on whose standards, uh, <laughs> sure. Okay. I know you do. Well, it's not loving if we're not telling the truth. Right. So let's start there. The topic is homosexuality, transgenderism, and pedophilia. Uh, we got a text from our good friend John who says it's a great topic and the right speaker for it too. Thank you for your encouragement. So let's just get um, let's just get into it. How do you want to start this to- conversation? So a lot like our conversation last week about um, the different types of murder, where we talked about abortion, euthanasia, and suicide, um, there is there are some general principles that cover all of what we're talking about today, mm-hmm. and and so those general principles would probably be good to start with. And um, you know, first of all, it starts with um, the gospel, and it starts with the authority that's that's found there. So. Any time in something like uh, human sexuality is really prone to this, where we just want to modify people's behavior. You know, we don't want to, we don't want people doing what they're doing. And it doesn't have to be just sexuality. You can think of anything. You think of lying or gossiping or extorting or whatever, you know. Um, think of anything that, okay, we don't want someone doing that. And so we just want them to change and we can like maybe vote people in who will like steer them away from doing those things or keep them from doing those things. All of that is just, behavior modification is all it is. Uh, What good does it do as a Christian who desires to see someone go to heaven if you change a liar into a not so frequent of of a liar? Mm -hmm. What what, what good does that do? There's no transformation. Yeah. Or or someone who's greedy, maybe you change their perspective on money and they're no longer like greedy as they once were, but they still reject Jesus as Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have we made any progress? Not really. Okay, we just uh, change their behavior in one area of their life. And so we're the, the core of all this is the gospel in that Jesus is king of the universe. All right. He is God himself, the eternal God. He has never uh, been not God. He's always been God. And he, this God came in human flesh, dwelt among us, died for the sins of the world. He never sinned once himself, but he died for the sins of the world. And he rose again, defeating death, that if we trust in his final sacrifice and and put the full weight of our trust in his finished work, believing that he is our king and our God, or as Doubting Thomas said when he wasn't doubting anymore, mm-hmm. Jesus, my Lord and my God, if we take that view with Jesus, then we are saved. 
And it's in that moment that the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. He He comes in and He illumines our, our understanding that we can read Scripture and understand, and He guides and steers our hearts into all truth. He leads us into all righteousness, and we're able to live for God and see our sin for what it is, and we're able to kill our sin through the power of the Holy Spirit. And And so that's the gospel message. If we start at the end of that and say, kill your sin, but never say how you get to that point— mm-hmm. Um, we're actually not presenting the gospel. All we're doing is saying, um, my opinion is better than your opinion, so you should change. Mm-hmm. But if we get a a full picture of this from God's perspective, we're talking about sin and righteousness and how we deal with that. And it starts with the gospel and it ends with killing sin. Mm-hmm. And and I like how you're saying that too, because Mike, you had struggled uh, with alcoholism, right? And you were trying really hard not to drink. And this was before you were a Christian and you thought you had to do that first and then be a Christian, but it lasted for a little while, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And no, then we can't clean ourselves up. No, no. It's We, we trust in God and, and people get out of certain sins and, and, and find their way through things like that without God on occasion. Right. But for the most part, it, it's trusting in God first, and he then works these things out of your life, mm-hmm. whatever it might be. Right. And then also, too, like I have this terrible issue with, with gossiping, which was, I mean, and these are all sins, right? So I just want to make sure that we understand <laughs> that, you know, it's grievous when you go against the design of our Lord who created us. And I was struggling with gossip. And even now, when I think I you catch were a bigger myself, liar than a gossip. Yeah, I was actually, I was, <laughs> I, was, I am. The I devil is an accuser. Heart. It is true. <laughs> but here's the thing. Now, when I catch myself, I'm catching myself and I know I'm, I'm grieved about it. And, and I I run to the Lord. And even in that situation, um, it's, it's, I'm running to God and saying, Lord, I don't want to be like this. I don't want that. Cause I know that this doesn't honor and glorify you. And I just love you. And I want to make sure that, you know, my heart is pure. So, yeah. Well, yeah. And so when we're talking to someone, um, and you know, I'm talking to Christians right now, when we're talking to someone about the sin of any kind of sexual sin, and they're just not getting it and they're not changing. Well, ask yourself the question, have they bowed the knee to King Jesus? Have they kissed the sun, as Psalm 2 directs us to do? So uh, if they haven't done that, then of course they're going to mock and reject and and scoff. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what sinners do. (laughs) While they're in their sin and they don't want any moral accountability, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. So you present the gospel to them, you you show them the love of Christ and the authority of Christ, and and you share the gospel with them, and um, if they're saved— then at that point you can start having those conversations about behavior. But if you start with, you need to change your behavior, you're actually just giving them the law and you're not giving them gospel. Mm, yep. Wow. Okay. So what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Sure. So um, what does the Bible say about God's design for human sexuality? I think is the question I would rather answer. Okay, so well as a politician, go I'm going <laughs> to move the goalpost a little bit. No, I love that. Um, I love that. That's the right question. The way I like to explain it is that God has a design patent on human sexuality. Mm -hmm. Okay, we read from the beginning that God is. That's the great presupposition of the Bible, and that's where all Christians start, is that God exists. We don't, uh, you know, wonder if he does. We know that he does. And so God exists, he creates. And what we see in Genesis chapter 1 is he creates all things, and the crown of his creation is the only thing that is made in his image. Uh, it's actually a person, and it's actually two people. God says in Genesis one twenty six, let us make man in our image, in the image of God he made man, male and female, he created them. So there you go. You have male and female created in the image of God. And Genesis 1 is like this telescope big overview look at creation. Genesis 2 is more of a microscope where we get more in the details. And we see that Adam was alone. He was created first and he was alone. And God brings the animals to Adam to see if there's a helper suitable for him. And all the men can resonate that none of them worked. All right. (laughs) None of them were suitable. That's a very diplomatic word for that. None of them were suitable. And so God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man. Genesis 2 describes this. He takes from man's side and he creates woman. And uh, Adam's reaction is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This works. Helper, mm-hmm. suitable. God was actually providing for Adam by creating woman. Woman was a provision for man. That's how, that's how Genesis 2 reads. Now, as we think through, why is all of that in there? Like, why would God bring the animals and see if they were suitable? Because doesn't God know all things? I mean, 
Fall back on your theology. Does God know everything? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Prophecy exists, right? Because God knows all things. He can inspire prophets, and those prophecies come true because God knows all things. So what was God doing if he wasn't genuinely seeking to see if any of the other creations were suitable? He was making it explicit that this was his design. Yeah. God was explicitly showing not just Adam, but the, in the revelation that's been preserved for us, he's showing all of us that he has a design patent on this. And this is the way that he has designed it to work. Mm-hmm. And uh, he says that man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Man should be joined to woman, and they become one flesh together. And that's uh, God's design for human sexuality. Now, um, as you get past Genesis, and, and I should just make a note too, any problem that we have in our society, it's tied back to Genesis 1 through 12. Mm-hmm. It just is. So for all those um, people out there who want to just punt Genesis 1 through 12 and say it's all figurative because they don't like the way that, you know, it, it doesn't fit with science and things like that, you're, you're missing everything because Genesis 1 through 12 lays the foundation for all of life. All right, so there's my note on Genesis. Uh, but y- I you, love how it gives us footnotes, too. Here. <laughs> <laughs> but you go on from Genesis, and you get into Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You get the law. Mm-hmm. And the law was never meant to impart uh, life to someone. It never has. The law can't do that. But what the law does is it shows God's holiness and his righteous standard, and consequently, it shows us our sin. Mm-hmm. And our need for a savior. And this is Paul's commentary on the law in Genesis chapter 3. The law was instituted to be a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. The great teacher, right? Our savior. Romans, right? Ro- uh, no, that was Galatians, Galatians 3. Galatians, yep, yeah. yep, that the guy, right? the yep. law is a, is a tutor. <laughs> and so, um, so what we see in the law concerning human sexuality, it gets very specific. There are, by some counts, 613 commands in the Torah, the, the, the law of God. And when we get in there, we see things that it's like, okay, well, that's not a struggle or that's not a temptation or that's not an issue today. And then we see other things that are like, wow, that is very anti, uh, that's that's uh, countercultural. Mm-hmm. That's the phrase I'm looking for. Um, apparently Moses wasn't an American in the 21st century, <laughs> right? Uh, no, he wasn't. Um, but his cultural status and our cultural status doesn't matter if we view this law of God as being an eternal moral standard. Mm -hmm. Now, there are different commands in the law. There are those that talk about what priests should wear and things like that that don't apply to Christians because we are all part of the same priesthood now. We are priests to God, and we reign with Christ. Uh, So we don't have priestly garments. We don't have a tabernacle or a temple and things like that because Christ is the end of those things. Uh, There are other matters that apply to Israel as a theocratic nation state that our country doesn't uh, you know, follow those rules to a T. We borrowed a lot of those rules, um, but those, <coughs> my apologies, but those rules do not apply to the church um, in a way that it's like, hey, we're creating our own civilization and these are our laws of how we all interact with one another. Mm-hmm. Like what happens if you're chopping wood and your axe head flies off and you accidentally kill somebody, yep. right? Mm-hmm. The law talks about that, but that's not um, something that applies today. And then there's morality in the law that we see uh, not only presented as just God's moral standard, but we see presented again in the New Testament as God's moral standard that's unchanging for his people for all time. This thing of the Ten Commandments, mm-hmm. right? Um, and pop quiz, do you know the only of one of the Ten Commandments that's not repeated? The Sabbath. Very good. You knew where I was going. Yeah, just like Bible college, you were ready for that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, You're a good student. <laughs> the, the only uh, one of the Ten Commandments that's not repeated in the New Testament is the fourth one, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And we find out in Hebrews chapter 4 that Jesus is our Sabbath rest. There remains a Sabbath for the people of God, Jesus. So, uh, but you see, don't lie repeated. You see, don't covet, don't steal, uh, don't commit adultery, all of those things in the New Testament. Now, um, kind of taking the long road here, but getting to the point, you see in that law and repeated in the New Testament commands concerning human sexuality. And you think of Leviticus 18, Deuteronomy 22, other passages. They say explicitly that a man should not lie with a man, a woman should not lie with a woman. Uh, it talks about how um, a man or a woman should not have relations with animals, which I just saw a headline last week about this. So uh, that is in our news to some extent. And so it does talk about these issues that in our culture today, 
we have by and large just kind of said, okay, well, this just must be the new morality that these things are okay. But God's morality that we see continued from the Old Testament to the New Testament that applies to all of his people at all times, that, uh, well, those those things are actually not okay, that God's unchanging moral standard does talk about human sexuality and gives us guidelines on that. So I just said a whole bunch of things. Sorry to monologue, but... No, I think that's important to lay down a foundation for our conversation. Uh, a lot of the... And you know what's so weird is that a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today and that we do see in the headlines, they weren't there 10 and 20 years ago because everybody was just shaking their heads, but now it's become touted as the norm and then shame on you for being intolerant if you speak otherwise. Um, and, and so especially for the Christian who is really striving to honor the Lord and to try to understand these things and to follow the Lord's way, um, it, it's it's very important that we dig through these things so that we have some clarity in how we speak to our culture today. Uh, very interesting. Um, you know what? Let's do this. Let's go to some music. And then I've got a couple of questions that I do uh, want to just kind of bring out and maybe just highlight some of the things that you said. But before we do that, let's do this as well. Um, let's do a call in to give away some tickets. Shall we do that? Okay. Um, right yeah. now, actually, let's do uh, text. The first person to text us will get four tickets to the October 18th for King and Country concert that is going to be at the Maverick Center. So um, that's at 7 o'clock p.m. October 18th for King and Country. Text us now, 855 539 4583. That's 855 539 Five three nine four five eight three for some four King and Country tickets, and it's four of them. You can bring some friends. Key Radio Life Unlocked, Truth Unleashed. That was a King and Country song, right? Yeah, four King and Country. Four King and Country. Four. It's a preposition. <laughs> I just stole. <laughs> I just stole a pen, and I just got. Anyway, uh, congratulations to Janine Phillips who listens to uh, our Provo station um, for uh, Hi, winning Janine. four four tickets to the Four King and Country uh, concert. So and, yay! It's gonna be awesome. Heather and I really don't have plans for that. I'm day. Just letting you know, Janine, we're your friends <laughs> too, right? Wow. <laughs> What kind of station is this? <laughs> We're family. We're family, right? And, and you you have to mention our other texts that we got. Uh, oh, from... yes. So we got a, a friend of ours. <laughs> this son wants to know if the guy with the shaggy hair chooses the song. <laughs> and yes, I do. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> And you do a great job. Well, Just thank you. Me. Now I think we call you Shaggy from now on. That's cute, too. Oh, yeah, my that, that's what... Um, um, Matthew Anderson's kids call me. Oh, they do? Yeah. That's good. Pastor Matthew Anderson. I thought we were going to call him Chewy. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was Scrubs. No, what? <laughs> Smudge. Smudge. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. He has so many <laughs> little names, Grant. That's good. Oh, my friend, we are talking about homosexuality, transgenderism, and pedophilia. And uh, big topics, huh, this morning? But yet very important to talk about these things. We should not be afraid to talk about these things uh, because the Lord has given us um, his word. And so we know that any time that we are depending on God's word, uh, that we are not going to be led astray. But here's the deal. People like to twist God's word. And that started right in the Garden of Eden when um, Satan said, did God really say? It's back to Genesis. Back to Genesis. So um, it's really important, though, that we understand what God's word truly does say. Do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, duh, Heather. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why I'm here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, interestingly, just uh, a few weeks ago, we had a, a person stop in at our at our church, came to a Sunday morning service, and currently we have Sunday school after our Sunday morning service. But that will not be so starting January 5th, the first Sunday in January. We're going to have Sunday school at 930 and the main service at 1045 for all of you who are listening. Uh, but we had someone who, who came to the service and then stayed for Sunday school, and she had a backpack. And on her backpack, there was a little pin that was, you know, like a rainbow, um, you know, a, a common gay pride pin that you would see today. And so uh, I just approached her on the topic and just asked her what she thought about how that movement relates to the Bible. Um, obviously, we're a Bible church. She knows that and just wanted to see what she thought. And she was full-on ready for that conversation where she had studied uh, some liberal takes on the matter of what God really meant when he said, 
that homosexuality and transgenderism were incorrect. Now, he got pedophilia was literal uh, in this case, you know, in the Old Testament, talking about, um, you know, maybe kidnapping or raping and all that. That was all literal. But uh, when it comes to homosexuality, she believed that that was somehow um, not literal as we understand it. And even in the New Testament, uh, Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 6 and other passages that talk about homosexuality, um, she claimed that it actually wasn't homosexuality. But mm-hmm. if you just turn your Bible sideways and squint a little bit, you can see that it actually means something else. And, uh, you know, those conversations are good to have just so everyone's cards are on the table. And uh, it really comes down to not only authority, but how we read Scripture consistently. Mm-hmm. And so if someone says, well, God is my authority, and I believe in the Bible, um, but I believe, you know, this list of sins over here is okay, and these sins are still bad. Well, um Can you read the whole Bible consistently that way? Can you read the life of Christ that way? Can you develop a theology about who God is and who man is that way? And the answer is no. You have to be consistent in the way you read Scripture. And so we we talked talked about that for quite some time. She was pretty energetic about that. And we haven't seen her again, unfortunately. Maybe one day she'll pop in again. Mm-hmm. But but that conversation allowed for us just to, to show where our perspectives, where we were coming from. Mm-hmm. And you weren't condemning her as you were talking to her. You were just searching Scripture together, right? Yeah, uh, and, just, and just being straight up with her. I mean, I want people to be straight up with me. Uh, you know, just tell me. <laughs> uh, especially when I'm, when I'm doing any kind of evangelism, um, I just want someone to be honest with me. I can work with honesty. You can't work with someone who's, you know, shifty or trying to like, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm really a Christian, but they know in their heart that they're not. You know, you can't really work with that. But someone who says, I've been rejecting God. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I know I've been running from God. You can work with that person. And so um, I, when it comes to matters of what's sin and what's not in the Bible and how we interpret it, I just want to be straight up with people and mm-hmm. expect the same in return. How do we get people to, you know, on, who have a view of kind of squint, squinting and twisting mm-hmm. and, and turning the word of God around? How do, how do we get, how do we have a conversation with them and, and, and bring them to see things as God sees them? Well, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing to recognize, just like with evangelism. You know, if we believed that it was all up to our persuasion, we wouldn't be able to sleep at night. Especially if you're someone who's shared your faith many times and you've been unsuccessful uh, and you think it's all on you. Okay, well, now you're starting to feel like a total failure. But God uses, as broken and as fumbling around as we are, he uses us to accomplish his purposes. And so we put it all in his hands, no matter if it's a, a in-house debate, Christians with Christians or Christians with those who are not Christians, God is the one sovereignly at work here. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so we rest in that um, but our approach to it is one of, I think consistency is the key word and, and going back to authority at all times. So for instance, you know, there's been a movement for the last hundred years to read those first few chapters of Genesis as being, um, alle- allegorical and not literal. Um, well, why would they ever conclude that? It's because the authority, the false authority of science or the false authority of man's opinion or the false authority of popular uh, opinion or the false authority of whatever says that those things aren't real and that it was all just an allegory. Mm-hmm. If you take God for what he says, then it's then it's real. So it comes back to authority and that consistency throughout. Because if you're going to throw out God's authority and his plain revelation at the beginning, what's going to stop you from doing that at any point? And the rest of the Bible, so um, I, it would come back to challenging someone on that topic. Mm-hmm. Can can we talk about possibly a commonly twisted verse, a verse that's very clear if you take the literal uh, view of of God's word, but a verse that people kind of twist and, sure. and kind of. I want to hear what what their case they would make on it. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so you would go to something like First uh, Corinthians six, for instance. First uh, Corinthians six is one of the um, several passages that we have in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul gives a list of sins. And this happens in Galatians 5, pretty famously, where he contrasts a list of sins with a list of things that the Spirit of God uh, leads us into. Um, but he says here in 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Okay, so if we stop right there, I think Pretty much anybody who has a Christian worldview can 
agree with that. Mm -hmm. There's a heaven and there's a hell. There's a righteous, there's an unrighteous, there's a good, there's an evil, all right? And so uh, the kingdom of heaven, those who inherit that which is eternally good are for those who, um, you know, have have pure righteousness, who enter because of their righteous standing. Uh, But those who are not allowed into the kingdom of heaven are not allowed because of their own sin. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. I okay. think I think that's pretty standard, you know, pretty right. fundamental to the Christian worldview. If you throw that out, then it's not a Christian worldview anymore. Sure. All right. So then he goes on to be specific about what that means. He says, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. So there's a list of different types of sins, ones that we can relate to and ones that we can't probably for a lot of people, but it's going to peg you at some point here where it's like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm given to that. Um, and it starts with sexually immoral. That's the word where we get uh, the word pornography. It's an all encompassing word that means any type of sexual sin. Then the next word um, is idolaters. Then the next one is adulterers. And then the next phrase, men who practice homosexuality. That's how it's been translated in the English standard version that I'm Uh, reading from, but there's a footnote there that says, um, the two Greek terms translated by this phrase refer to the passive and active partners in consensual homosexual acts. All right. And you can do a study on that. There are all kinds of tools online where you can, um, you know, do, do Greek studies without knowing Greek and all of that. But, but there it is in the text and it seems pretty plain, Mm -hmm. doesn't it? It does. Uh, but it would be taken by someone who wants to kind of change the authority structure and, and, then get sin approved by God by saying, well, you know, it actually doesn't mean homosexuality as we know it today. What they were actually doing in that culture is older men were taking younger men captive, like kidnapping them and taking them to be like their own kind of sexual prisoners and and treating them and abusing them in that way. And it wasn't like um, today where you've got a man who pledges covenantal love to another man and engages in that sort of activity consensually. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's just not the case. I mean, even the the footnote here, it says it's talking about consensual acts, and you can go back and study that. Uh, Romans 1 would be another one that is so incredibly clear, talking about uh, the one who rejects God, the people who reject God, the societies, the cultures that reject God. It says that God gives them up to their dishonorable passions. In chapter 1, verse 26, he calls this dishonorable, saying, the women exchanging natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. The men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty uh, of their error. That's Romans 1, 26 and 27. And so there's another place where it just seems so absolutely clear that it's consensual, it's willing, it's rebellion, and and that's what God calls dishonorable and shameful mm-hmm. uh, and ultimately sinful. Mm-hmm. I, I do want to point out, too, this, one of the questions was, um, can a person be born gay? What do you have for that first? Uh There are two ways of looking at that. The way that most people think about it when they're asked the question or they they ask the question is, does God design people to be homosexuals? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, going back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, that's God's design. Okay, God doesn't design people to go contrary to his original design. Mm -hmm. Um, He uh, he brought all the different... uh, creations to Adam and none of them were suitable. So he made something that was suitable. The provision for man is woman. Mm -hmm. That is God's design. Mm -hmm. And so now in the sense of now, are people born into sin? Are people born with a uh, passion for homosexuality? Are people born with a passion for greed? Are people born with a passion for whatever sin? Yeah, Mm -hmm. we are all born into sin, but in, in the, in our temptations will vary, but God does not design anyone to be homosexual. And the reason why I bring that up, too, is if you're looking back at 1 Corinthians 6 that we were just at, and we started on 9, but if you continued into 11, it says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, 
you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So um, you don't revel in being greedy. You don't revel in being a thief or an adulterer or an idolater or a homosexual or any of that or a drunkard um, because we are delivered from our sin. We're free from the bondage of sin through Jesus Christ. And that is hope for all of us, no matter what sin that uh, the Bible defines that we might find ourselves in, if we lean into the Lord Jesus, we ask for help and we pray and we walk with him, we can be delivered from that. And and I bet today, if this was um, announced today, say the Apostle Paul lived in our neck of the woods and he declared this and people heard him, he would be accused of conversion therapy. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Because they were, were washed, they were sanctified, they were justified, they have been converted, therefore they have turned from their sin and they've turned to Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, that's conversion, turning from (laughs) something and turning to Christ. Staying in your sin is perversion. Mm -hmm. Turning to Christ is conversion. And um, that is how we are free from any sin, no matter what it is, is through receiving the righteousness of Christ through faith alone. Not by, well, look at us, we're just all good heterosexuals and we pat each other on the head. That's not how we are justified. We are justified by placing our faith in Christ, receiving his complete, perfect righteousness. That is our ticket to heaven, so to speak. That's what gets us in uh, to the kingdom of God, is God imputing to us that which is perfect and putting that on our account, and Jesus taking our sin. And through that conversion, we are free from the bondage of sin, so we're no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness through that conversion. The other question then, kind of on that same thread, is how about a person who is born a man but feels that um, he's really a woman? Like, um, I'm I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. He should buy a mirror. Uh, (laughs) Um, Because uh, because God doesn't make mistakes, Mm -hmm. all right? Um, And God doesn't uh, God God doesn't put somebody who is, and I guess you would have to say spiritually a woman. In a man's body, or or I don't even know the argument that would be made there, um, but he gives human beings chromosomes, and he doesn't mess up on that. Mm-hmm. And the Bible talks about men who want to dress like women and women who want to dress like men and present themselves as the opposite of their God-ordained gender. And that's sinful because it's saying that, well, God made a mistake, and I need to correct it. Uh, God, my authority is imperfect, and so I will correct God mm-hmm. is really what's being said there. So that is uh, it's just a false idea. Um, don't want to take that stuff flippantly, but at the same time, it's so clear. And anybody who wants to make it complex is really just trying to change the authority. Mm-hmm. And then finally, I guess, um, with the amount of time that we have left here, um, just a question. If a young person consents to a relationship with an older person, is pedophilia wrong? Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what we see in um, in Scripture, and this this can get really complex too, because it, my wife and I were engaged when she was a senior in high school and she was 17 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, I got permission from her father to date her and to propose to her. Uh, so we see in Scripture, Numbers chapter 30 and some other places in Scripture, uh, a woman, uh, a female, she is led by and protected by her father until she's given to a man. And um, now ages can be totally arbitrary. Like why is our drinking age 21 and our smoking age 18? Mm. Those are numbers that we put on it, right? Um, It has to do with maturity. It has to do with uh, father's approval. It has to do with um, doing it in a godly way and getting counsel from God's people and any marriage, not just in this situation, but in any marriage, mm-hmm. all these things have uh, apply. And so now if there's a, th- a 50 year old who says, well, this first grader is consenting to marry me, um, I would have a long list of questions, but the, probably the first one would be, can I talk to her father? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that'd be the first one. Mm-hmm. Wow. Oh, our time just flew. Do you have any other questions, Mike? I, no, I, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a concluding thought. They, um, that'd yeah. be good. <laughs> at, at the end of Romans 1, this is important to know. So we read from Romans 1 earlier about um, the perverse sexual desire that is a result of suppressing the truth of God and embracing sin. It says at the end of Romans 1, the last verse, verse 32, it says, Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, 
they not only do them, but also give approval to those who practice them. So there are people that might say, well, I just don't want to be in other people's business. I want to let them do their own thing. And, you know, they're just going to be passive in it or even say, if they're happy, that's fine. You're approving something that God has called worthy of death, Mm -hmm. sin. Mm -hmm. You're approving it. And um, you have to understand that if you're a Christian, you're saying you believe in this God who cares about everything. He cares about all the details of our lives. We say, why would God care about these things that are just in my heart or these things I do behind closed doors? It's because God cares about every detail of our lives. Mm -hmm. And he gets down, it says the word, his word, it cuts down to the thoughts and the intentions of the heart because he cares about those things because he designed you for a purpose and he died on a cross to save you from your sins. Mm -hmm. My friend, God loves you. I I hope that you're understanding that and you were fearfully and wonderfully made and he gives you his standards and his design map for you um, to guide us through this life. Um, So please don't misunderstand that. (coughs) If you want to know more about how to be saved, go to our website, keyradio.org. Hit the eternal life button. Thank you, Pastor Jeremy, for this great conversation. This has been Mike and Heather in the Morning, a production of Key Radio, located in beautiful Provo, Utah. For more information about the program and the ministries of Key Radio, check out our website, keyradio.org. On behalf of Mike, Heather, and the entire Key Radio staff, have a blessed and glorious day.